So welcome to Shakina Television for Yes Lord and here we are at Our Lady and St. Patrick Catholic Church in Wales and I'm joined by Pastor Gareth Lyshen. So Pastor Gareth Lyshen, it's great that you can uh, join us here. Um, first of all, would you mind telling us a bit about yourself? Gladly. Yeah. Sure. I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. I became a Catholic when I was 16. I've been a Catholic priest for just over 14 years now, 12 years spent in parish ministry here in Wales, but for the last two and a half years, I've been a traveling missionary working with Zion Community based in Brentwood, Essex. Oh, wow, Zion. So, could you tell us a bit more about Zion? Because I've heard that you're quite heavily involved in that. Is there yeah, a bit more you can tell us about that? Gladly. Yeah. So back in 1984, a Catholic priest working in Nottingham Father Pat Lynch had an inspiration to found a group of Catholic missionaries, wow. priests, religious sisters, and lay people working together to go into parishes to help Catholics to take their faith more seriously. Because lots of Catholics are just people who attend Mass and haven't looked more deeply into their faith and haven't yet realized they're called to be followers of Jesus and to take his message out and encourage others to follow Jesus. So Father Pat, gathered a team to himself who started doing parish missions from September 1985. And then in the 1990s, that team grew and we acquired a retreat center in Brentwood, Essex, which became wow. community headquarters. So we can have residential events for young people, for families and for women there. We also have a youth team that was put into place in the 1990s that does secondary school missions and, and another team that does primary school missions. Wow. So I first got training with Zion Community when I was a deacon in 2006, and uh, I very much enjoyed the experience of parish mission. So as a priest, I volunteered to help on a few missions yeah. and felt the Lord was nagging away saying, yeah. you could do this full time, you yeah. know. So I went to my bishop and said, how would you feel about releasing me from parish ministry to be a full-time missionary? I never thought he'd say <sighs> yes. And to my surprise, he said, I think that's a good idea. You should go and you should go at Christmas time. So that was in 2018. Wow. So since January 2019, I've been working full-time for Zion Community, expecting wow. to be doing a lot of traveling as a parish missionary, but because of the world crisis we've all lived mm. through. In fact, I've been chaplain to a group of young missionaries who got locked in so I could yeah. have the congregation singing together through the pandemic. And we reinvented ourselves as digital missionaries. Mm. So I've learned how to edit videos awesome. and do Zoom calls augmented with graphics. And yeah. so I wouldn't call myself a YouTube star, <laughs> but if you search for me, you'll find me. Well, that's great that you can go about in different avenues and, and preach. In those different ways. So you mentioned that Sion, it's it's about a lot of it. It's about working with youth, and it's about or helping um, with the youth side of things. So going back to that, why uh, going back to the early parts of your life, uh, were you always a Catholic? Were you brought up in a Catholic family? Um, cause, yeah. No, I'm the first Catholic in my family. Oh wow. So I had a grandfather who was very involved in the Anglican Church. Mm. I grew up in a town called Llanelli. He was a member of a church there called St Albans. He sang in the choir. Mm. His faith was very important to him. My parents, not so much. They were both brought up Anglican Church in Wales. They both stopped going to church when they were teenagers. When I came along, my grandfather put a little pressure on them and said, you are going to have baby Gareth baptised, aren't you? <laughs> So I was christened in the Church of Wales at nine months. Mm. And then a few years later, I was old enough to go to Sunday school. And Grandpa put the pressure on again and said to my parents, you are going to send Gareth to Sunday school, aren't you? And so they gave me a choice. Would you like to go to Grandpa's Sunday school? But you have to walk up a hill and it's cold yeah. and it's drafty. Or you can go just around the corner to the Salvation Army where it's nice and warm oh, wow. and they've got a band. So given this totally unbiased choice, Naturally, I said, I'll go to the Salvation Army. <laughs> I think really it was more convenient for the parents mm. and we had a distant cousin there. But anyway, from the age of about four or five, I went every week to Sunday school. I learned Bible stories. Mm. It was head knowledge. Yeah. I didn't really think about it any more than I thought about the kings of England yeah. and 
the geography of Wales and the other things I learned in school until I was 11. And that's when my granny died. Both grandfathers died when I was quite young and I didn't really process what was going on. Yeah. So the first loss that really hit me was losing one of my grannies when I was 11, that was 1985. And my dad said a strange thing. Dad said, Gareth, say a prayer for your granny. Me? <laughs> Pray at home? Well, we didn't do praying at home. It wasn't mm. part of our lifestyle. But I was hurting and mm. Dad had said to pray. So I thought, mm. I'll give this a try. Yeah. So, God, are you there? Uh, God, if you are there, please look after Granny. And God, if you're real, maybe you should show me. I mean, if you're real, that's important. And what happened next is very hard to put into words. As a scientist, I like to define things and pin them down. But all I can say, it was a definite feeling that there was someone there I was connecting with mm. when I was praying. So I tried praying to this someone who I sensed was there, and I prayed for lost things to turn up. And at that stage in my life, they did with startling regularity. It doesn't work like that now, yeah. but I'd say, if you want to get your prayers answered, mm. find a very new Christian and get them to pray for you, because I think God will answer them more <sighs> to encourage them. So having discovered that there was a God, there was someone to connect mm. to in my prayer life, I started reading about all the religions mm. in the world, and a few months later, I started secondary school where I was given a Gideon Society New Testament wow. with the promise to read it every night. So I read my way through the whole New Testament mm. in two years, and the God presented in Jesus there very much fitted with this someone I was connecting with wow. in my prayer life. And the claims that Jesus rose from the dead seemed credible, so I didn't really give much thought to becoming any religion other than Christian. Yeah. But what kind of Christian? Mm. I was going to the Salvation Army yeah. Sunday School. Good start, worshipping Jesus mm. every Sunday. I was living a fairly moral life. I was never a naughty child at school. Mm. So all the morality stuff in the Bible, that made sense. There was one thing that demanded a change of lifestyle. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this in memory of me. Mm. And the Salvation Army, although they study the Bible, they don't do sacraments at all. They yeah. don't have any kind of communion service mm. because their founder thought it wasn't necessary. Mm. But to me, Jesus said, do this. So I had to do it. But where was I going to do it? I read about the different Christian churches. The Protestant churches had communion and said it was only a symbol. Mm. The Catholic church said it's really his body and blood. The Anglican church, somewhere in the middle, depends which Anglican you talk to. So by the time I was about 14 and a half, I decided in my heart that I wanted to be a Catholic. I hadn't yet plucked up the courage to tell my parents. Yeah, so going on that, so when you actually had to come and tell your parents or even tell someone, like what sort of feelings were churning up inside and how, if you did eventually do it, how did you find the courage to actually tell them? Things came to a head towards the end of 1988. Mm. For a couple of years, I thought, I'll just wait till I go to university yeah. and then I'll be out of the house and I'll become a Catholic then. But that was a long way away and mm. the time of waiting got deeper and deeper. And eventually I thought, I need to send a letter to the local parish priest. Uh, okay. So I wrote something down about yeah. my life story and I posted it to the parish priest with a message saying that I would telephone him. So back in those days, we didn't have mobile phones. There were things called phone boxes uh, and you put coins in yeah. the slot. So I went to the phone box and rang the parish priest. And of course, the first thing he said was, you're under 18, mm. we can't do anything without your uh, parents' permission. Mm. So you do need to talk to your parents. Uh, okay. So it was about a week before Christmas, 1988. Mm. And I remember one evening, both my parents were at home. They worked shifts, so catching uh, okay. them together yeah. wasn't always easy, mm. but they were both there. And I said, mum, dad, I've got something to tell you. I'd like to start going to the Catholic church. <laughs> They were surprised. Mm. Mums are very clever creatures. <laughs> Mum had clocked that I'd gotten religion because she'd mm. noticed the Bible was going back in different places uh. on the shelf day by day. Mm. Now, if I'd said I wanted to join the Salvation Army and become a full member, that would have made sense mm. to them. Or if I'd said I wanted to go Anglican, yeah. family heritage, that would have made sense. But Catholic? Where did that come from? Yeah. So, they didn't really want an explanation. They just shrugged their shoulders and said, well, it doesn't make sense to us, but if that's what you want to do, 
feel free to go. Mm. So I went to Mass for the first time on the Sunday after Christmas, wow. 88. And then I had to wait for the converts course to start in September mm. of 89 and eventually became a Catholic 1990 at Easter when I was in the lower sixth at school. Wow. So becoming a Catholic after you'd done all this research on all these different religions, it clearly had a lot of thought into it. What was that feeling like with your first communion service? Um, yeah, talk us through it. Well, I'd like to be able to tell you it was wonderful, but the honest answer was a real anticlimax. Ah. Because uh, I'd wanted for several years to receive Holy Communion. Mm. I'd made my first confession a few days before. Yeah. And the night came, it was the Easter Vigil, so I was going to be confirmed and formally received into the Catholic Church yeah. and take First Communion. But I'm not a very emotional kind of person. I'm a scientist by temperament. Yeah. And there are days where I wish I would have positive feelings and it just mm. doesn't come out that way. So at the end of the Mass, the religious sister had taken me through our say, mm. said, how do you feel, Gareth? I remember feeling really disappointed. I couldn't say, it feels wonderful, Sister Margaret, but mm. all I had was the objective reality. I'd taken my first Holy Communion. I believed in it. I didn't feel particularly buoyed up or wonderful mm. about what had happened. So that's just one of those things. If you haven't got a temperament that responds in strong emotional ways, sometimes you're not going to feel good about things that are good. Yeah, so 14 years old, you become a Catholic. So going on from there, I'm guessing you're still at school. Did that affect any of your school life as you as you carried on through school? So basically, what was your next chapter really? What went on from becoming a Catholic? Well, I was 16 by the time I actually became a Catholic. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah, 16. And it didn't really feature much in school. Mm. And I'd already been trying to live according to Christian morality. Yeah all the time I was in secondary school. Mm. I'd always been a volunteer for helping out with school assemblies. Oh, okay. As well as falling in love with the Catholic Church, mm. I'd also fallen in love with astronomy. In fact, I fell in love with astronomy oh. first at the age of seven, wow. and then decided I wanted to carve out a career path yeah. in science. So my school time in the later years was dominated by studying physics and maths, oh, okay. and pursuing my goal of becoming an astrophysicist. Wow. So, yeah, that goal of becoming an astrophysicist, obviously, you're here, we know that that didn't happen. So, from originally becoming a Catholic and, and then going on to pursue, possibly pursuing a career in astrophysicist, how did you go from there into your journey towards priesthood? Was there a definitive moment where you're like, ah, oh, I want to be a priest? Or was it more of a gentle journey, you could say, or process? Well, actually, I did become an astrophysicist. Oh, I got my PhD, oh wow. And Incredible. then I entered seminary. Wow. So while I'm not a practicing astrophysicist, I'm proud to say I am an astrophysicist incredible. and a priest. Wow, that's incredible. Wow. Which means I'm so heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good. <laughs> Or that's maybe it means I can tell you both how to go to heaven and how the heavens go. Wow, that's incredible. So you're an astrophysicist as well, so that, that's incredible. So it's like you're a specialist in two different fields. Has there been times where your studies in astrophysicists has helped your your priesthood, your um, yeah, your vocation in the priesthood? Has there been times where they both come together and it's helped? I would say the journey of science and the journey of faith were two parallel journeys. Mm. One thing I found really helpful was that in second year comprehensive school, okay. when religious studies were very much about the Old Testament, they did present ways of reading the Old Testament, mm. particularly the creation stories that made sense alongside what we know about the Big Bang and evolution. Yeah. So some Christians will take Genesis stories and say they must be read absolutely literally, mm. but the Catholic Church doesn't insist on that. It leaves you free to say, okay. well, maybe this is telling us something symbolic or maybe it's something literal. So with a clear conscience, I could accept what science was telling us about the Big Bang and evolution, and at the same time say, well, Genesis is God's revelation. It's telling us something deep about who human beings yeah, are in yeah. God's eyes, and I don't have to take this literally. So 
but neither did looking up at the beauty of the night sky mm. give me a gosh wow moment. There must be a God to explain mm. all of this. Because actually, a lot of the structure and the patterns that we yeah. see there, I can write down the mathematics and explain that. Mm. So I know the things that he doesn't need a God to explain, yeah. not directly. Because then you say, why do the mathematics work? Mm. And maybe the mathematics work that way because there were lots of possible universes mm. and God fixed things for this one to be yeah. one for us. Or maybe there's only one mathematically consistent kind of mm. universe there can be, and this is it, which would mean the universe is true in some fundamental mathematical way. But then God is truth, so that truth is a reflection of who God is in some way. So maybe it's not what most people imagine by calling God creator, but it still makes sense yeah. to me that God is involved with how the universe is, but the science makes sense as well. So we can see how like science and religion like can fit together there. Um, so yeah, upon becoming a priest, when did you exactly decide that like, that you wanted to become a priest, and how did you go? How did you go about that? Like, who did you contact originally? Was there like a first person you told that you're going to be a priest? So, what was your journey into into priesthood? 